Hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's word together once again. I want to go back to Exodus chapter 14 as we read the story of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Um, This is obviously a very important story in the life of God's people. Um, Probably until the cross of Jesus Christ, there's going to be no more important story of redemption than the story of what happens at the Red Sea. So we want to take our time and go through this passage and see what God's word has to teach us, particularly as it has a lot to say about pilgrims and the pilgrim life. And we want to relate that to our journey as pilgrims, as sojourners through this world. And so I just want to read Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 19, and think a little bit about those together. So Exodus chapter 14, beginning our reading at verse 15, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen." Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Uh, So why just read 15 through 18? Uh, Why why stop there? Why not go through the whole part? Uh, Well, again, because this is such an important event in the life of God's people, in the life of Israel. This is an event that the Old Testament will look back to again and again as the great evidence of God's redemptive power, God's redemptive work for his people. The Old Testament will look back to this event over and over again. And we could easily say that until the cross of Christ, the deliverance of God's people at the Red Sea is the great salvation event of the scriptures, uh, pointing forward ultimately to the coming of Christ. But it stands as that constant reminder that God is a saving God. Um, Remember, we, we saw last week that Israel was trapped between Pharaoh and the Red Sea. We call that sort of the devil in the deep blue sea, right? The, the Red Sea stands between Israel and the wilderness, Israel and their journey, Israel and the promised land. So they're in some sense, they seem to be trapped. The Red Sea is on one side of them, keeping them from going forward through the wilderness to the promised land. And Pharaoh's behind them, keeping them from moving out of this impossible place. But as God reminds us again here, this is all part of his plan for delivering his people, showing his glory in their deliverance and in the judgment of their enemies. Um, And we left off last time with them saying they didn't need to worry because God was going to fight for his people. Um, That Moses was trying to comfort the people by saying God will fight for us. All we have to do is sit back and be silent. We'll watch God destroy our enemies. Um, And so this event, as I said, is one that the Old Testament will come back to time and time again. The Old Testament makes about 25 separate references uh, to what God does here. Um, I remember when I preached sermons on Exodus, when I got to this point, we sang psalms and all of them referred to the Exodus. You can go through, there's many references in the Old Testament. So this is something worth taking time to look at as we go through. And I, wanna, I want us to particularly focus on how God provides a path for the pilgrims here. Um, Israel seems to be an impossible position, right? Pharaoh uh, has been provoked to pursue Israel precisely because they've come to a place with no way forward. He thinks they're wandering and that's how they've come here. That it's because of their wandering they've ended up in this indefensible, incomprehensible place to camp. And that's kind of encouraged him to come out and attack them. Um, And when God's people had seen Pharaoh, they cried out to him because they were so hopeless and helpless here. Um, And that's when Moses gave them that great encouragement. But that that makes verse 15 all the more strange maybe to us that we read God saying to his people um, or the Lord saying to Moses on behalf or speak to speak to the people. Why do you cry to me? That should strike us as a very strange thing for God to say. Why do you cry to me? Uh, God is essentially saying, why are you praying? Um, doesn't that seem odd, an odd thing for God to say? Why are you praying? Doesn't scripture tell us to pray without ceasing? So what does God mean by saying this to Moses? Um, is it a reprimand? Is it not the right thing to do? And I think what God is teaching Moses is, I've heard the prayers. The time for praying and pleading is over. Now is the time for action. 
I think the essential message that God comes to with Moses here is to say, stop praying, start moving. Um, I've heard your prayer. Everyone cried out to me. I've heard the prayer. I've come and told you the plan. Now go forward. Um, and this is a good reminder for pilgrims too, as we're sojourners through the world, uh, that there is a time to pray, right? And, and prayer is essential. I've reminded you from time to time of, of John Bunyan's really wise words where he says, until you've prayed, there's nothing better that you can do. Right? Prayer is so essential that if you've neglected prayer, you've neglected doing the best thing you can do. Uh, but the reason I like Bunyan's statement is he says, you know, until, there, until you've prayed, there's any other number of things you might do. But until you pray, that's the best thing you can do. But once we pray, we're also called to move. There is a time when it's time to stop praying and start acting, right? What would happen if we prayed for daily bread from our God and then just sat around waiting for it to fall in our mouths? Um, or what if we pray that God would make us more holy, but we never pursue holiness in trying to live upright and righteous lives? Um, what if Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done, and then not gone on to do the Father's will? There is a time when we've prayed. Prayer is essential. We should begin everything, do everything, end everything with prayer. But there is also a time when we're called to do what God has told us to do. And God is essentially saying that to Moses. It's, it's no longer time for prayer. I've heard your prayers. It's now the time to move. Uh, but what's the problem? There's nowhere to go. Right? And for them to be able to move, for them to be able to go forward, God is going to have to make a way. The whole point of the passage of where they are now is it seems like an impossible place. They are caught between the Red Sea stands between where they need to go and the Pharaoh and his army is behind them so they can't move that way. So God is saying move on, but it seems like Okay, Lord, but if we move on, you're going to have to make the way because we can't see a way forward. Um, and the good news is that God will make a way where none exists. Lift up your staff, verse 16, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Moses is to stretch out his hand over the waters like he did at the Nile, and God will provide the path. God will make the way forward. Um, the Lord will make the path so that they can pass through, not just pass through, but pass through on dry ground. Um, and so why did we want to take this time to think about uh, this time when it's time to stop praying and start moving? Because there are times when God is telling us to go as pilgrims through this world where it seems like the way forward is impossible. Um, it would have seemed to them at this point like there is nowhere to go. And it's meant to make them feel that there's nowhere to go so that they understand that only God can provide a way forward. And then God says, go somewhere and promises that you will go that way and end up at the destination he's promised. He will make a way, right? He promised he would lead them through the wilderness into the promised land. They're now at this point where it seems like there's no way through to the promised land. And what is God saying to them? I will make a way. And this is such an important thing for pilgrims and sojourners to remember. Because there are going to be times in the pilgrim life where it seems like we've reached a dead end. Where we say we understand that we're called to go forward and we understand the promises of rest that have been made to us. That we understand where God has said we're going, where Jesus said we were going. But I feel like I'm at a dead end. I feel like there's no way forward. Um, there's, there's no place that feels like that quite so much as death. Uh, when God has promised life and we're faced by death, can God really make a way forward? Uh, and that's what this, pa this passage is wonderfully reminding us of. If we come to a dead end that seems to stand between what God has promised and where we can go, when it seems there's no path forward, God will make a way. There isn't going to, he's not going to allow something to stand between his people and what he's promised them. Uh, his people and the promised rest. Not even death can stand between 
God's promises and the rest that he will provide to his people. God will make a way. That really is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is teaching us as well. Um, what, what seems like more of a dead end than the tomb of Jesus Christ? He suffered, he died, he was buried. That seems to be the end of things. Um, but what happened? Where well, there seemed to be no way forward, God made a way forward. He raised him up. Um, and this is a, 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 an important thing for pilgrims to keep in mind when it seems like we've reached a dead end of the world. The Lord will not permit anything to stand between his people and what he's promised. He will make a way. He doesn't leave us to make a way ourselves. Um, I, th I think that's a, a trouble facing the church in our day is that people see all these things standing between us and the promises that God has made. See, the world seems to be standing in, putting up all these barriers, all these impediments. And, and people start to panic and they say, well, there's not going to be any way forward unless we make a way forward. No, what is this passage teaching us? God will make the way forward. We don't have to doubt that God will make a path for his people so that nothing will stand between us and the rest that he's promised. Nothing can stand between us and the destination that God has promised to bring us to. And that's one of the things that we learn from this passage at the Red Sea. And, and we need to remember that as pilgrims. Keep this, keep this picture in mind when you feel like in life, when it may seem to you in life, that you've reached a dead end, that you're not going to get to the promises that God has held out to you because it just doesn't seem like there's a way forward. And what is this passage telling us? God will always make a way forward so those people are able to pass through whatever problems they're facing and pass into the rest that he's promised. God will not fail to bring pilgrims home. And if an ocean stands in the way from the, in between them and the promise, he'll split the ocean. If death stands between them and the promise, he'll destroy death. He'll raise people from the dead. Uh, there's nothing that will keep us as pilgrims from coming home. God will make a path. God will make a path so that we can come home. What, what rich comfort that gives us as God's people to know that God will make a way so that we as pilgrim people We'll find the way home, and we'll find rest for our souls. Thanks be to God for opening that way through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross. Let's pray and thank God for this blessing. Father in heaven, we know that the pilgrim existence is a difficult one, that sojourning through this world is fraught with difficulty. And there are going to be times in our sojourning that we face impediments before us when we feel like we've come to a dead end and there's no way forward. And we thank you for this passage. It reminds us that this dead end that Israel faced was all prepared by you. It was prepared by you as the way you were going to entice Pharaoh to follow so that he could follow to his own destruction, so you could show your glory in, the vindic in destroying the enemies of your people, that this was the means by which you brought Israel to see how you would provide a way forward. And so even when things seem to be out of control, that we seem to be at a dead end, that things are not out of your control. And that when we feel like there's no way forward, that we're not going to make it through to the promises you've extended to us, may we remember this event, that you are a God who always will provide a path, that you have promised that we will come home and come to rest, and there's nothing, not even death, that will stand between your people and the rest that you've promised. We thank you that you are a God who splits seas in half so his people may pass through, that you're a God who raises the dead so that his people will inherit the promises. Thank you, Father, for being the God who provides a way forward. And we thank you for the path that you've opened by the death of your son, Jesus Christ. May we live in that confidence that we as sojourners will come home to the rest that you've promised. And may we wait on you, pray, trust you, and move forward in the confidence that you will not leave us or forsake us. We thank you for that promise. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Help us to continue to always look and trust in you. And we thank you for your spirit that has shown us these truths and the son you've given to us who's made the way open for us. Hear us, for we pray in his name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.